Okay. Can everyone hear me? Great. All right, let's go ahead and start this. Okay. Thank you, very, everyone, for uh, attending ex the new exchange, Data Loss Prevention. My name is Steve Chu. I am a senior technical, technical product manager uh, for Exchange uh, in Redmond. My uh, area of expertise is actually Exchange Online, but um, because uh, Exchange Online uh, requires the knowledge of sort of the end-to-end -end product, I also have a lot of dealings with uh, our compliance story, which uh, involves DLP and, of course, archiving and e-discovery, which I'll be presenting later today. And uh, so today we're going to focus on DLP, data loss prevention, which is um, a new capability we're introducing in what we're calling the new exchange. And I'll explain that, uh, that name in a second. Um, but uh, I'm hoping you're all in the right session. If not, this is your opportunity to get up and leave. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the reason we're calling this the new exchange, just uh, for some context, is um, we, we decided to, to develop the next version of Exchange, um, leading with the cloud, and of course, uh, making sure that um, the on-premises software is um, just as good. And um, as a result, we don't have versions in the cloud, and so we were um, cautious of assigning 2013 to all versions of Exchange that are coming out in the new release. So uh, generally, when we refer to Exchange 2013, or Exchange Server 2013, that's talking about the on-premises software. And then when we refer to the new exchange, that's talking about uh, the 2000, 2013 version of Exchange in the cloud. Um, for simplicity, I'm going to just refer to uh, Exchange as Exchange 2013. Um, it's just easier. But uh, just note that uh, you know, when we're talking about the new capabilities in Exchange, we're talking about it for both the cloud and on-premises. Okay? All right. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So um, what I'm highlighting here are the three big security challenges that we're trying to address with uh, the new version of Exchange. And uh, the top bullet here, rapidly evolving external threats, is something that we try to um, address in Exchange Online Protection, which is the uh, evolution of FOPI in the next version of Exchange. Um, we're not going to talk about anti-spam, anti-malware in this session. Uh, that'll be a topic for another day. Uh, today, we're going to focus really on addressing the two challenges below. Um, which uh, data loss prevention really covers. The first is obviously the potential loss of sensitive data. This is extremely important in, uh, in today's um, you know, sort of global economy, right? Making sure that uh, you protect your IP, making sure that uh, your employees are aware of the risks of disclosing confidential information outside of the organization, things like that. Um, it's all very, very important um, uh, in this day and age, especially since uh, you know, we have this information explosion where the amount of data is going to completely grow exponentially over the next decade. Um, I think 40 times is the amount of data that's going to grow relative to uh, 1.4 times, which is the number of uh, admins there to manage it. So um, with this sort of proliferation of data, we need to make sure that there is no leakage or loss of data um, within the context of work, right? And this is why we build these product, um, products and why we build data loss prevention into Exchange 2013. And of course, keeping email safe without impacting users, right? At the end of the day, um, your employees and users will go about their business, and if you make their lives hard, they're just going to find a way to work around it. So the best way to make sure you don't lose data is to make sure that the processes involved in doing so do not interrupt and disrupt end user productivity. And we'll show you how we do this uh, with Exchange in 2013. Okay. So, these two headlines might look familiar. They're actually real news headlines. Large retailer leaks payment information via email. It's pretty bad. Accidental email with attachment exposed hundreds of individuals' names and social security numbers. So, most organizations don't want to be associated with these types of headlines. Big or small, it's just not good. Uh, quick raise of hands. How many of you think that this is an issue for your organization? Go ahead and raise your hand if you think that's a problem. Okay. So, so majority of you, which is good because that's what we're trying to prevent with our technology, with our security and protection story for Exchange 2013. Now, for those of you who are not as worried about PR, uh, about you know, bad press or whatnot, um, you, you will still find value in these tools. Uh, and you can see here there's a Gartner report that stated last year 
Faced with never-ending and expanding regulatory and industry mandates, organizations invest tremendous amounts of energy on audit, compliance, controls, and in some cases, risk management. At the same time, they seek to free staff resources from mundane tasks such as evidence gathering and simple reporting. So, as you can see, this is something, compliance, data protection, it's something that every business knows is important. You have to comply. You have to comply with industry regulations, with legal requirements, um, with organizational requirements. Um, it's just something that you have to do. And oftentimes, business dictates to IT, this is what we need to do, and IT doesn't know where to start. How do we enforce this? How do we protect our data? How do we make sure that end users aren't sending things they shouldn't be? And, you know, it's, it's always the good intention of IT to try to implement these processes and impl implement these controls, but really, where do you start, right? That's the question. And what we found is that many organizations don't even know the level of risk associated with their company. They don't know how much risk is actually flowing in and out of their organization. So what we're going to do here is provide tools that allow organizations to, one, prevent data loss, you know, and to, you know, protect their organization and protect their IP and protect their sensitive data, but also to make sure that they understand how much risk there is in their organization. You know, how, how often are they running into situations where employees are sending sensitive data outside of their organization? And that's what we're going to try to address. All right. So let's talk, let's take a little history lesson here. The controls for policy enforcement have been in place in exchange for a while now. We've been uh, innovating in exchange from transport rules in 2007 to transport rules with rights management in 2010, as well as mail tips and outlook. And then of course in 2013, we now have data loss prevention. So we're trying to arm IT administrators to arm our customers with the tools that will allow them to control policy enforcement within their organization. And the great thing is, there's no one way to do it, right? Every organization is different, and so flexibility is really important. Flexibility in terms of how these controls are enforced and how they're implemented is going to be critical to ensuring that you don't disrupt productivity, you don't disrupt end user processes uh, while you're protecting your organization. So, you know, on the left side of the dial, and we like to think of it as a dial, right? You just you can you can kind of move it, you know, at your leisure, uh, and it will it, you know it will it will trigger different tools and mechanisms and levers by which you can control the policy enforcement in your organization. The far left, we have alert, right? Best way to characterize that is mail tips. And for those of you who are not aware of mail tips, it was introduced in Outlook 2010 and Exchange 2010, and uh, basically. Uh, anytime uh, an end user would send an email that violated a policy, for example, they were sending an email to someone outside their organization or they're sending an email to um, a very large distribution list, um, as just as examples, uh, it would pop up a message, sort of an early warning system, before they sent the email to let them know that, hey, are you sure you want to send this? Um, you may be violating policy, right? Uh, and that's just an alert. It didn't stop them from sending it. They could still send it. And uh, the, the conditions by which that mail tip, uh, you know, showed up was determined by the administrator. They configure it. But, you know, it was based on things, as I, as I said, like if it was sent to an external recipient or if the DL was too large or things like that. What we're doing in data loss prevention is actually taking that a step further, right? And we'll talk about how that, that looks uh, in a few slides. But you can go from alert to encrypt. And encrypt, as you all know, you can uh, use rights management. You know, you can use all sorts of different types of encryption to make sure that the email is protected when it's in transit. You can dial it further and say, okay, we will actually block the email from being sent unless the end user clicks on an override button. And now this, now we're getting into actual DLP in 2013. And I'll show you this in more depth later in the presentation, but what this is is, the same thing as a mail tip, but instead of just warning the user, we're actually going to prevent them from sending it. We're going to disable that send button unless they click on an override link. And when they click on the override, we will let them send it, but we will also initiate an audit trail, right, to make sure that all eyes are on that, uh, that, that, inter that transaction. And then you go all the way down to the right-hand side of the dial, and there is the opportunity to block. And you can do that today with transport rules, right? 
What we're doing in 2013, though, is we're going to allow a lot more flexibility around what conditions you block an email from going out. And we'll provide a lot more visibility in terms of how that's determined. OK, so I'm going to start with transport rules. And um, everyone here is aware of transport rules. Raise your hand if, if you use transport rules today, or at least you know how transport rules work. OK, just about everyone. That's good, because it'll be really easy for you to understand how DLP works for Exchange, because DLP is built on transport rules. It's very straightforward. Um, but for those of you who don't know what transport rules are, there's a few of you in the room who didn't raise your, your arms. So let's go ahead and, and talk about it. So transport rules have basically three characteristics that need to be considered. And transport rules work very much like Outlook uh, inbox rules, very similar concepts. So those of you who use Outlook inbox rules will understand this uh, pretty easily. But basically, there's, there's three attributes that you need to, uh, to consider when you're creating a transport rule. One is conditions. If something happens, then the rule needs to take action. And the condition by which that rule uh, takes action is what you decide here. Could be as simple as you know, being sent to a particular recipient, or it could be much more, uh, you know, much more in depth and much more involved than that. You can see some of the options here. Now, I talked about conditions leading to actions. And so we've got some actions here, things such as blocking the message or you know, moderating the message, sending the message to a particular mailbox. These are all actions that you can take with transport rules today. And then exceptions are cases where the condition applies, but the action will not be taken. And this is totally optional. Now, we have some new transport rules um, in 2013. Uh, that should make uh, administrators' lives a lot easier. Because what we've done is we've taken some of the rules that uh, you have in FOPI, in uh, Forefront Online Protection for Exchange, uh, today, and we've merged them into the EAC, which is the new Exchange Administration Center for 2013. And the EAC, for those of you who don't know, the Exchange Administration Center, EAC, is the new web-based management console in 2013. Uh, that is, it's great because what it does is it, um, it's basically one single management console for um, all of your uh, management tasks, whether it's something you used to do um, in the um, Exchange Control Panel or in the EMC uh, or in the FOPI admin. Uh, now you get all of that in one web-based admin console. And uh, as a result, you now get transport rules also that were um, part of the FOPI policy. Things like sending to quarantine or um, uh, connectors, things like that. Um, but we have some specific options and new predicates that we filter uh, in 2013. I'm going to run through them really quickly here because some of them are actually pretty cool uh, and, and pretty, uh, you know, uh, pretty relevant to what you're trying to do. So you, know, you can run uh, transport rules now to be configured for a certain period of time. Uh, you can also run them in test mode. Now, this is important. This is important to understand because what we're doing with DLP is not just allowing um, our administrators to protect their organizations, right, through blocking or you know, encrypting or things like that. We're also helping our administrators understand what level of risk exists in their organization. And that requires testing. That requires tuning. And so what we've done here is we've allowed um, transport rules to be tested. So what that means is um, the transport rule, every time there's an instance of the transport rule um, you know, picking up a message, uh, an incident report will be sent to whoever should receive that report, and that's configurable by the admin. And you can set it to test instead and not enforce. So for example, if uh, an email has a credit card number in it, and the transport rule picks up the fact there's a credit card number in it and decides, oh, this is sensitive content. Instead of having the, the transport rule block it from being sent, you can simply have an incident report get sent to the administrator. And that, in that sense, the administrator is able to say, OK, well, here's an instance where a credit card number was sent via email in my organization. And then as soon as you start getting hundreds of these things, then you start realizing, oh, this could be a problem. There's a lot of transfer of credit card numbers, sensitive data in my organization. And 
I got to determine whether or not that's my, my employees being, you know, uh, malicious or whether it's just making mistakes and it's a matter of educating them, right? So um, understanding that level of risk is extremely important. Doing so without, you know, intruding in normal business practice, right? You don't want to just start blocking emails. You want to determine what's the level of risk. And the test mode is, is what's allowing you to do that. All right, other filters. We've got the ability to filter um, by total message size, attachment extension, keyword matching, IP address. There's new actions such as forcing TLS routing. Uh, in the same way that Outlook inbox rules work, you can stop processing rules um, after, at the end of the queue. So uh, a lot of new goodness in transport rules in 2013. And of course, the biggest one is data loss prevention. And the example of the credit card is one that I use because that's exactly what DLP does. DLP acts just like a transport rule. There is a condition and an action. The difference is the condition now recognizes what sensitive information looks like. So it can recognize what a credit card number looks like in the body of an email or in the attachment of an email. It can recognize what a social security number looks like. It can recognize what even fuzzy terms potentially in SOX or HIPAA or other types of regulation look like, right? That's the difference, is that now we've built the intelligence of recognizing this content into the transport rule capabilities of exchange to provide a much more end-to-end -end data loss prevention solution. So what we do here with data loss prevention is help to identify, monitor, and protect, okay? Identify means finding that sensitive information whether it be in an email or in an attachment of an email. It means monitoring, so giving you the ability to test, test out these policies to figure out what level of risk exists in your organization. And then, of course, it allows you to protect. Allow that rule to take action. You can block, you can encrypt, you can send to a moderated mailbox, you can do all sorts of things. Now, there's two aspects to DLP that I'm going to focus on in this presentation. The first aspect is this concept of user education. And the best way to describe this is mail tips, maybe, maybe mail tips on steroids. Um, we have now the ability to educate end users when they're sending things like credit card numbers, when they're sending sensitive content they shouldn't, and letting them know that, hey, look, you may not want to do this. The second aspect is uh, around uh, administration, right? And so I will walk through two demos, because I know you, know you guys don't want to hear me talk the whole time. You want to see some live products. So uh, one demo will be with what we're calling Outlook policy tips, and then the other demo will be on administration. But first, I want to focus on this user education piece, because it's really important. This is our key differentiator at Microsoft Exchange. Um, uh, there's a lot of third-party DLP products out there that are very good. But the one thing they don't have is direct access and integration to Outlook. And that's something that we at Exchange do have. So we're taking advantage of it. We are uh, basically um, providing end users with a mail tip-like experience to notify them when sensitive content appears in their email. And not only does this happen online, it even happens offline. So when uh, a user is um, offline, they're not connected, and they try to send an email through Outlook that has credit card numbers, social security numbers, things like that, um, they will still get blocked, potentially, or whatever the policy is. It'll still work. And you might be asking, how is that possible? Well, what we do is the client actually um, gets updated every 24 hours with new DLP policies on the server that um, require the client to act. So when you create a DLP policy on the server, there is a box that you can check that says uh, allow uh, client notifications. And when you check that box, at the 24-hour point that uh, the, the server is supposed to, to uh, notify the client, um, that particular policy will then get transferred over to Outlook. And Outlook will know uh, to trigger that policy tip um, when it's in violation, even when the user is offline. Okay, so pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Now, 
How many of you um, know every policy, every sort of disclosure policy and compliance policy within your organization? Raise your hand if, if you know everything about your organization's sort of regulatory environment and what, what you shouldn't be sending. So a few, that's good, that's good. So a few of you probably work really closely with your compliance teams, your legal teams. I'm sure that's probably the, the main reason you're so on top of it. I mean, you guys are so busy, there's no way, I mean, if it was your choice, you'd be uh, on top of all these things because you've got a million other things to do, right? Now, how many of you think that your users, your, your employees, are on top of these regulations? Raise your hand. Not many, right? And the point here is that there's no way for you to ensure that's the case, right? That's not even part of your job description necessarily. But what you can do with these tools is actually improve that situation is to have your um, users, have your employees receiving just-in-time education on their organization's policies around compliance, disclosure, um, data loss, things like that, okay? That's what the value is of the Outlook policy tips, and that's what really differentiates this offering from other DLP offerings in the market. All right. So, um, I talked about the incident report. Uh, this is when uh, you want to test, when you want to test a policy, right? And uh, when you test a policy, you don't necessarily enforce the policy at transport. You might just generate an incident report to let you know that, hey, this happened. We didn't necessarily enforce it, but it happened. And uh, you can configure this incident report to be sent to anyone. It could be a compliance officer, it could be a particular mailbox that only has certain permissions associated with it, only certain individuals can access it. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of um, how you configure this. But uh, I, wanna sh I wanna show you this, and then after this we'll, we'll do a demo. Because this is actually a big part of how um, we really fulfill that value prop uh, in DLP and Exchange. So the first thing we provide is audit data, okay? And uh, remember, incident reports are primarily here. The objective is for tuning and auditing, okay? And there's other workflows. There's other workflows that can extend from this report. So for example, if you have a severity level of high, right? There's high, medium, and low. If you have a severity level of high, that could kickstart a whole new workflow associated with that particular interaction at transport, okay? Um, so this is a great mechanism for even more extensive auditing. Um, it also gives you information about whether or not the user clicked on override, right? Remember I told you there's an override option potentially where uh, the user's not able to send an email unless they click on the over override button. Um, this will tell you whether that was the case. And there's also an opportunity for um, users to indicate whether there was a false positive. So maybe it, it said, hey, there's a credit card number in here, and there wasn't. And in that case, they might click the false positive button. And that's important information because that'll tell you that you need to tune these rules a little bit more. But once again, this is all about control. IT administration and control, right? You have the control to configure this however you need for your organization. Whether you need a soft control or a hard control, you can tune it with these rules and this incident report, okay? Um, the next thing, classification. So when I refer to classification from here on out, it's referring to the sensitive content Okay, the credit card numbers, the, uh, the SWIFT numbers, whatever, whatever sensitive content that you need to protect, um, that's considered the classification, that's the data classification. And we have actual classification rules that apply, that's the algorithm, that's the intelligence that lets you know, hey, those are 16 digits, but they're a credit card number, okay? And we're not talking about a regex that counted 16 digits, we're talking about intelligence, okay? So it's a 16-digit number that passed the Loon algorithm, right? So we know it's a credit card. It also contains a CCV number and an expiry date and the word MasterCard. Okay, confidence level's pretty high. We think it's a credit card, right? The, uh, the system thinks it's a credit card. So you have a few things here. The data classification tells you what was the data that triggered this particular incident report, and then how many instances of that data showed up, right? In this case, one credit card number showed up. And the confidence level is 85, 85%, which means um, pretty confident. And you can set a threshold of confidence level as well, right? 
if, if you're fairly tolerant to credit card numbers passing in and out of your organization, you can set that confidence level to 100. And you can feel comfortable with that. If you're very sensitive to credit card information leaking, then you might set that confidence level lower and just catch anything that, that, that even remotely looks like a credit card. And finally, rule details. So what was the rule that triggered this DLP uh, incident? Um, you know, what was the action taken? And you can see here, the action taken was set audit severity level, rights protect the message, notify the sender, and generate incident report. And there's a myriad of other actions you can take. Remember, you can take up to 50 actions and conditions on any rule. So there's a ton of stuff you can put in here to really customize these incident reports and customize these rules for whatever you need. All right. So let's try a demo out. And let's do this. All right. So two things. One is I'm going to sit down. So uh, don't mind me if I sort of if you lose me in the view, um, because uh, it's, it's a lot easier for me to get through the demo when I'm sitting. Secondly, uh, just a disclaimer, uh, we are in preview right now. We're not yet at RTM, as you guys all know. Um, so uh, the environment is still not 100%. So you know there might be, uh, just in case there's hiccups here and there, just to put that out there. But it should work. Uh, I tested it many times. So let's give it a go. All right. So I'm logged in as Sarah D uh, from Contoso. And uh, this is Outlook, as I'm sure you guys have seen it by now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new email. And I've got, uh, let's see, I've got a message here that I sort of pre-populated, which includes some credit card numbers. I'm going to give it a Give it subject. Now, Sarah just doesn't know that there is a organizational policy around sending credit card numbers. So she's about to send this email off with some credit card numbers in the, in the body of the email. In fact, there's two of them here. And she's going to send it to someone outside of her organization. So she's going to send it to Bob at Tailspin Toys, because she works at Contoso, remember. And you can see immediately the mail tip popped up that said the following recipient is outside your organization. And the policy tip also popped up, saying this message contains sensitive content. Your organization won't allow this message to be sent until the content is removed. And it's not kidding. You try to send, and it pops up and says your organization won't allow it. And remember, you can customize, as the administrator, you can customize the actual strings you use in these messages. Okay? All right. so. If Sarah hovers over policy tip, she'll see that this message contains credit card numbers. Now, there's a button here for her to report a false positive, if indeed it is one. And if it is one, it'll let her send. Um, she also can learn more about the organization's policy. There's a link here, and you can, you can set that URL to whatever you want. Um, but in this case, it looks like she can't send it at all. Credit card numbers are blocked. So she's going to go ahead and uh, try something out. She's going to change credit card number, first digit to one, and the policy tip goes away. So once again, this is not simply a regex. This is actually intelligence saying that even though the credit card number there has 16 digits, it can never exist with a one as the first digit. And so the policy tip goes away. She can now send it. It's not a real credit card number, right? So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get the original message back on here because she does want to send this out to somebody. She really just wants to get rid of her credit card information. And she's going to go ahead and send it to someone inside of organization. So now this is Alex Darrow, who is part of Contoso. And you can see the policy tip came up as expected. Uh, same sort of message when you hover over it. But now it says, this message may contain sensitive content. Your organization won't allow this message to be sent. To send this message, you must override your organization's policy. She clicks send, still doesn't send. So now what she decides to do is click override. And now it says, your action will be audited by your organization. And then when she sends, 
uh, she's able to do so. Now, what this is doing is, this is opening up a whole world of options in terms of how you want to audit this, right? It sends the incident report. Um, the incident report generates, uh, you know, summary data in terms of how often the credit card number DLP policy was violated, right? And you can get a lot of metrics around that. And then there's an extensibility story here potentially with partners also building reporting off of that and so forth. So um, certainly a lot of workflows um, downstream uh, as a result of, of, of these policies. All right. So let's go ahead and um, open up. Dennis D. Now, Dennis is our, uh, is our compliance officer. So uh, it's been configured for the incident report to land in his inbox. And in, I'm going to log in as Dennis in a second, and you'll see the incident report, hopefully, of, uh, of the email that Sarah just sent out. But it usually takes a little time to land in the inbox. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Sarah really quickly. And let's open up a new email. And uh, she's going to. She's going to try again, attach a file. This time she wants to attach a couple of uh, documents. And she's going to send it to Bob again. And voila, the policy tip appears. And this spreadsheet is highlighted yellow because apparently there's sensitive data here. And you can see the credit card numbers, lots of them. So, She's, she can't send this. And uh, so let's go ahead and uh, change it to Alex. And you can see that the override option is now available. So even in an attachment, uh, the um, policy can, can, uh, uh, can recognize sensitive data, right, within the, the header, the body, as well as the attachment. OK? All right. So I'm hopeful now that uh, Dennis is able to get the incident report. So let's uh, go ahead and log in. And uh, there you go. It just got sent. Uh, this is the incident report, Sarah Davis. Uh, it's got everything we talked about. You have the audit, right? You got the severity low. Override yes, false positive no. You got data classification here, credit card number, two counts of it. Remember, there were two credit card numbers in that email. Confidence level 85. Uh, recommended minimum confidence 85, so it meets that. And then tells you what rule was hit. Um, and it also gives you uh, uh, a copy of what that email looked like. And you can even get a copy of that email um, as an attachment. Um, so you'll, you'll log in and you'll see what that looks like. See? So a lot of information in this incident report. And uh, Dennis can now take certain actions based on what information he received uh, from Sarah sending those credit card numbers. OK? All right. So that's the demo of the Outlook policy tip. Let's go ahead and uh, switch back. All right. So uh, I talked about the fact that we have one administration console um, in 2013, Exchange Administration Center, which uh, allows you to manage all of your exchange administration uh, uh, controls as well as DLP. This is another uh, important um, competitive advantage that we have in exchange is offering a single management experience for DLP. Because a lot of third-party DLP um, products require a separate management interface to manage the DLP portions of it, right? Um, and you know, the fact that we have all of that in one console that's web-based that you can access anywhere should hopefully make uh, your lives a lot easier. It should reduce a lot of the inefficiencies of managing these policies. And that's the intent. Uh, and once again, you can also manage you know, anti-spam, anti-malware, um, archiving and compliancy, discovery, all these other things um, from this one management console. So that's really important. 
Now, I've talked about DLP policies, and I think uh, in talking to a lot of customers and, and, and folks who are new to this product, they, uh, they don't always understand what the structure of the product looks like. So I'm going to try my best to explain that now. Okay? Um, if you understand what uh, transport rules look like and how they work, you're going to understand this pretty easily. Okay? So what we have are what's called DLP policy templates. So DLP policy templates are basically a collection of two things, well, three things, actually. One, transport rules, two, classification rules, and three, reporting, okay? Uh, think of it this way. The classification rules are the what am I looking for. The classification rules determine what sensitive content the DLP policy is looking for. The transport rule then tells you what conditions by which you should take action because it found that sensitive content. Okay? So really, a DLP policy template is just a collection of those two things and then any sort of downstream uh, reporting that's uh, related to that. Okay? You can, uh, now, we, we provide DLP policy templates out of the box, primarily for PII, financial, things like that. There's lots of industries, lots of geographies that we won't provide DLP policies out of the box for. And we're going to rely on partners to fill those gaps. We're going to rely on partners to build DLP policy templates and sell them to customers um, because they have that expertise in that particular industry or that particular geography. Okay? Um, you can also build your own. So there's a lot of flexibility. It's sort of an open platform in some sense, right? Um, uh, it, and and I'll, I'll tell you what a DLP um, a policy, what, what actual format it takes. But yeah, it, 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 it's quite um, an open platform in that sense. Partners can build, uh, you can build, uh, and certainly we will provide quite a few out of the box um, from the onset. Okay, uh, so a DLP policy template is essentially an XML blob, right? It, it contains those rules. And uh, the um, DLP, uh, the XML, that uh, the actual DLP policy templates um, can be encrypted so that if partners want to protect their IP when they're um, providing these DLP policy templates to customers, they can do so. And uh, once again, you know, the, um, uh, you, can, you can build off of the classifications that we provide out of the box as well. So there's a lot of classifications that we also, classification rules that we, we provide out of the box, such as credit card numbers. And from those classification rules, you can build your own DLP policies from them, okay? So uh, now we're going to talk about the classification rules themselves. And um, the one thing to know is that the classification rules, um, basically, they, they represent the common types of sensitive data that you want to identify in email. And, uh, Make no mistake, email is where the majority of data loss happens, right? There's a lot of research that supports that. Um, certainly attachments, documents, things like that uh, are, have many instances as well, but really email is the easiest way for um, an employee to, to, to leak sensitive data. So uh, we have an advantage because we are exchange. We, uh, you know, we provide email for the majority of enterprises and businesses around the world. Um, and we have Outlook, which is one of the most, which is the most popular uh, uh, rich client for, for email. So uh, you put those two things together, we are well positioned to provide the protection that, that customers are, are, are needing, that organizations are needing. And uh, the sensitive content is really, this is, this is the, the magic, right? This is the magic for DLP. This is what really differentiates DLP from transport rules, is the fact that there is intelligence behind uh, the DLP content that gets, um, that, that gets uh, uh, monitored and uh, acted upon um, with the policies. Uh, and once again, this is extensible as well. So partners might provide DLC policy templates. Uh, partners might provide classification rules as part of the DLP policy template. Okay, because remember, a DLP policy template could include many classification rules, right? It doesn't have to be just one. Um, oftentimes, one classification applies to one DLP policy, but not necessarily. Um, and, uh, but partners may also just provide a bundling of classification rules. They might say, here is all the financial data content that you get in France, 
and we're providing everything to you in one big batch. And go ahead and create your own policies from that batch of rules, right? So uh, the extensibility story for this is, 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 is quite broad, and there's a lot of possibilities there as well. Okay, so quick review. DLP policy rules, okay? DLP pol remember, DLP policy is basically a bundling of transport rules and classification rules, right? We talked about classification rules, now we talk about the transport rules. And it's that simple, they're transport rules, right? There's condition, there's action, as you can see here, conditions, actions, and, ex and ex exceptions. Okay, so it's very straightforward. So it's simply a transport rule that has identified sense of content and can act on it. All right. Um, the one other thing I'll mention about that is it's two clicks to test. So it's very simple. It's not a long, drawn-out process. Um, really, it's two clicks to test. You can start testing these policies right off the bat. And remember, we provide a lot of the policies as well as the classification rules out of the box. So you can start testing it right away. All right, um, we're gonna have another demo shortly, um, but one last thing I wanna talk about is rights management. So uh, most of you are familiar with rights, but how many of you use RMS? Raise your hand if you use RMS. A couple people, all right. <laughs> so um, for those of you who don't know, rights management is the ability to apply granular restrictions on email, for example. Um, some of you might know it as IRM, right? Information Rights Management Protection. So you can prevent emails. An end user can actually apply an IRM to something, to an email, and prevent uh, that email from being forwarded or from being read or from being, um, there's a lot of things that you can prevent actions on that email. But it's, it's on an item, right? And um, you know, in 2010, we introduced uh, the ability to set IRM from transport rules, which is great. Um, you can set a transport rule on the server that says any email that contains this condition, we will uh, rights management, rights manage, protect it. Now, the story is even more rich in this version because now not only can you set rights management on uh, an email through a transport rule, you can do so through a DLP rule, through a DLP policy. You can say any information, any email that contains credit card numbers should be IRM protected. That's pretty powerful because now you're combining two very uh, strong and very um, ubiquitous forms of protection together. And uh, now, and most, most of you might not know this um, because not many of you are using RMS today, but um, RMS online will also be available. Okay, so we will have a cloud service for RMS. Uh, and that will actually come with the premium versions of the suite, of the Office 365 suite. So not many of you are using it today, but hopefully a lot more folks will be using it, especially those who are moving to the cloud or already in the cloud. Um, they will have the opportunity to use RMS fairly easily. I know it's, it's quite difficult to configure, to set up, and to deploy, which is why um, a lot of folks don't have it. But uh, certainly this is a good story for us moving forward, especially um, as uh, customers consider moving to the cloud or move to the cloud. All right, uh, let's do one more demo. And then uh, not too much more after this, so then we'll open it up for questions, okay? All right, let's, uh, let's see. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, we'll sign out of Dennis. And let's go ahead and here's the Exchange Administration Center. This is the single web-based console for, uh, uh, for Exchange 2013. And we're gonna sign in as Dennis. So here's what it looks like. You can see you can manage both on-premises and online from this one web-based console. Uh, and if you go to compliance management, data loss prevention, you'll be able to manage DLP from here. Um, uh, first thing I'm gonna do is click on the uh, create, and you can see the options here. You can create a new DLP policy from a template. Now this is a template that we provide out of the box, or maybe it's a template that you purchase from a partner. 
um, or maybe it's a template you built yourself, you know, whatever it may be. Um, now, when you build a new DLP policy, you do it from here. Um, but when you import the template from a partner, let's say, you do it from this control here. And then if you develop your own, you do it from here, okay? So there's certainly different workflows for each of those options. But when we want to create a new DLP policy from a template, uh, you can see that name, description, pretty, pretty uh, standard. Um, but you can see some of the templates that we provide out of the box here. Everything from financial data in Japan to PII data in the UK. And there's a description of what it is here. Um, these are policy templates we will provide out of the box, and we will provide many, many more at RTM. Okay, I've, I've received assurances from our engineering team that this is just the tip of the iceberg. That said, um, we will be focusing primarily on PII, financial data, things like that, and so certainly our partners will have to provide um, templates for other industries, other regulations. Um, but this is what we have here. Now, here's, the, here's where I can assign an incident management mailbox to this DLP policy. And uh, if I want Dennis, um, all I have to do is add Dennis, and there you go. Now, anytime there is an incident associated with this policy, Dennis will receive that incident report. And you can add any other mailboxes that should receive it. Okay, so this is fully customizable by the administrator. Um, you can really determine where this information goes, because obviously this is sensitive information. You don't want everyone getting access to it. Um, and then you also have the option, of course, to test without notifications. Okay, so you can test without the policy tip. You can test with notifications. That means you can test with the policy tip, and you can just straight out enforce it. So this is the tuning that we talked about, determining what level of risk is, is, exists in your organization. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cancel this because we have um, a policy that I created here. Um, and if I go ahead and click on the edit button, you'll see that we're enforcing it. And if I click on rules, you'll see I've got three rules here. So this policy um, contains three rules. And the first rule, which is actually the second one listed here in the queue, but the first one I'm going to talk about is what happens if a message is sent to somebody within the organization. So remember, when we did the policy tip demo, you had two different uh, outcome states, depending on whether or not the recipient was inside or outside the organization. Um, same thing here. Uh, you've got a condition whereby if somebody's inside the organization and the message contains a credit card number, it says, notify the sender that the message can't be sent and block it, um, but, but give the override option, okay? So this is a condition specific to internal recipients. Uh, and then make sure the incident report goes to Dennis D to, and includes the original email. Okay? Um, that's pretty straightforward. Let's look at this one now. Uh, this is external recipient low count. Now, what does low count mean? You might be asking yourself that. Well, same thing. If sent to outside the organization and the message contains a credit card number, now what you're going to do is notify that it can't be sent. And this time, it really can't be sent. There's no override option. Um, the incident report goes to Dennis, include the original email. Uh, now let's take a look a little further into this one. You can see here, these are the rules, right? These are the rules that you can configure. Uh, a lot of customization options here. You can, uh, for example, customize the message, the, the actual strings that appear in the text. Um, but if you click here, you can see that the sensitive information that we're detecting, the credit card number, has a minimum of one and a maximum of nine. So that's what the low score is alluding to, right? If that email or that attachment contains anywhere from one to nine credit card numbers, it will trigger the low uh, count rule, okay? Now, just to show uh, the opposite of this, if you look at high count, and we take a closer look at this, you can see that the credit card number is 10 minimum to any maximum. So any email or attachment that has more than 10 or more credit card numbers is going to uh, be subject to the high count rule, which probably, I'm assuming, is going to be much more stringent, much stricter than the low count one. And you can see you can also set the threshold based on confidence. 
In this case, we have minimum default and a maximum 100. So big basically has to be a confidence of 100. Okay, and we talked about confidence before. Confidence is determined by the corroborating evidence that supports the notion that it is that sensitive content type, right? So CVV numbers, uh, expiry dates, things like that. All right. And so you've got uh, other options here as well. You've got the stop processing more rules. So if you have a particular rule that should take precedence, you can click on that, um, on that, uh, that button. And then you've got also the opportunity to set it within a certain period of time. And once again, the ability to test or to enforce. Okay. All right. So that's DLP administration. Um, pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, if, you know, if you understand transport rules, it's, it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, let's go ahead and go back now. Okay. Um, the, the one last thing I'll talk about before uh, closing up, summarizing, and, and taking questions is um, around reporting. So uh, by default, you'll get sort of the summarized reporting on how many incidents there were and override, false positive, things like that. Um, there's also the option of downloading uh, an Excel workbook that includes um, a lot more information in a lot greater detail. Uh, and this also includes, uh, you know, information you get uh, for anti-spam, anti-malware, et cetera, from uh, Exchange Online Protection as well. Um, the one thing to note is that this is available for online customers. And on-premises customers, we're working with a partner to, uh, to build this out for us for on-premises customers. Okay, so um, in terms of online versus on-prem, DLP is the same across both with the one exception, which is the, ex the downloadable Excel workbook that's available for online only at, at, uh, at GA. Okay. okay, so quick recap, uh, and then I'll go ahead and, and take questions. Um, Exchange DLP. The, the real differentiator for us, there's two differentiators for Exchange. One is the Outlook policy tips, right? We have uh, the, uh, the privilege of being able to integrate directly between Exchange and Outlook, and so we can integrate that experience of DLP and uh, give you, our customers, the opportunity to, um, uh, to educate your uh, end users, your employees on internal regulations, on internal compliance policy, things like that. Uh, this is available in Exchange Server as well as Office 365 and Exchange Online. Okay, once again, the reporting is the only difference there, but everything else is the same across both. Uh, we provide out-of-the-box DLP policy templates, primarily uh, PII and financial. Uh, we also provide the predefined sensitive content types. Those are the classification rules. Okay, and uh, once again, those are all obviously um, primarily PII and financial as well. Um, and then we have uh, partners who will uh, provide DLP templates and classification rules for industries or geographies that we don't cover out of the box. DLP administration, this is really our other um, differentiator, is the fact that all of the administration um, for DLP happens where you do all of your other administration, creating mailboxes, managing e-discovery, um, you know, setting retention policies, uh, whatever it might be, it's all in one admin center, which means makes your life easier. You don't have to log in, authenticate in two different places to try to get this done. And finally, we have rich reporting. Um, on, online customers get it, uh, and then um, on-premises customers will have a partner providing that. Okay, so that leaves me with the three pillars for security and protection. The top one is primarily uh, anti-spam, anti-malware. Uh, our Exchange Online Protection story of protecting communications, but really the, uh, the bottom two we talked about today, which is enforcing policy through DLP, through transport rules, things like that, um, providing you the most control in terms of enforcing policy for your organization, and then, of course, simplifying management, making sure that that experience is, um, is simple and it's straightforward and it's easily accessible. So that's, uh, that's pretty much all I had in terms of content. Here are the resources. You've probably all seen these slides a million times. And then if you uh, please uh, submit an evaluation if you can. It certainly helps us in improving the content. Um, and of course, we have some cars to give away too. So I know you guys all, you guys all know, this, uh, know this routine now. Um, 
and that's it. So uh, if anyone has any questions, happy to try to answer them. Um, and certainly, I'll be around right after the session as well if we don't have time to attend to all. And there's quite a few. So let's start on this side of the room. Yes? Yep. Um, so the question is, uh, when setting policies, do we think of Active Sync differently from Outlook? And um, as far as I know, there shouldn't be. So whatever you do with transport rules today with Active Sync should it should work the same way. Yeah. So there shouldn't be any any difference there. Uh, next one over. Yep. Right. So, good. Okay. So the question is, what if uh, we can't um, read the attachment? So, a um, couple things. For example, if it's SMIME encrypted, we won't break it. Um, I think with PKZIP, we're, we're, we're potentially building something there. Um, but uh, you know, the, you know, if something is not intended to be um, um, read, then certainly um, there will be potential blockers there. Um, but you can you can actually set policy for those instances. So. Um, uh, you know, so that that would probably be, be the default. But I think the majority of use cases, it should it should work. Yep. Uh, yep. 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 Right. So the question is, um, could somebody game the system by clicking false positive? Right. Um, I don't know. Is that? Uh, I think you can. You can still. If it's a false positive, it can still get blocked. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So um, you. Uh, it, it depends on the severity level, right? And if it's severe, it'll still block it. So uh, yeah. So you can configure that. Basically, is, is the point. Yeah. So if you absolutely, if, if credit card threshold is really high and you're really sensitive to it, even if they click a, on the false positive, it'll block it when it needs to. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, you can apply policies to different groups. Uh, so our question is, can you apply policies to different groups, or is it across the board? You can definitely apply policies to to different groups. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, you can you can specify to HR as an example, or or any other um, AD group, whatever you want to set. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, question is: Is it uh, licensed as part of the base product, or is it an add-on? It will be um, uh, licensed as part of the the premium offering of Exchange. So, yeah. Um, no. No. No separate. It's no separate add-on. Uh, anything else? <laughs> Andrew? The, this question came up at Decorating, which is, it's meant to block an accidental release. A yep. malicious user who wants to bypass, will probably find a way around it. Yeah, good, good point. Okay, so uh, Andrew points out that um, people have made the point that, you know, if a malicious, a malicious administrator, for example, wants to get that information, they're going to get it. And yeah, that's that's true. You know, really, um, the the objective of DLP um, is to do two things, right? It's to make you smarter about the risks of your organization and put you in the best position to um, prevent the the accidental loss of, of that information, um, and to educate your users and make sure that they're not accidentally um, losing this information. But you know, if somebody wants to put sensitive information on a USB stick and walk out of the office. You know, we're not going to be able to. There's a lot of corner case scenarios we're not going to be able to address. Um, so really, the point here, and, and why Andrew raised the question, is you know, the purpose of DLP in exchange really is to um, to address those accidental accidental data loss um, you know, issues. Yep. Extension on that, I mean, there's some good capability in there. Yep. Is that being extended into your proxy server offering? Um, Hmm. Question, yeah, question is, will it be extended to our proxy server offering? I, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Let me get back to you after the session. Okay. Any other questions? Or should we go straight to, yeah. Yes. 
Uh, question is, can, uh, can you apply policy uh, to user groups in administration? The answer is yes. Right, so the question is, um, if uh, you set a block policy f and the user has Outlook 2007 or 2010, what happens, right? Um, that's a good question, actually. So uh, the policy tips is specific to Outlook 2013, okay? And it'll be the Pro Plus version of 2013. Um, and the reason is, you have the downloading of the DL pol policies every 24 hours. So that's done on the client side, right? So we haven't built that, we haven't, we haven't uh, built that into to older versions of, of Outlook. Um, that said, the policies still work, okay? The policy tip won't show up, right? If the user is using Outlook 2007, they're not going to see the policy tip. But if they try to send the email and it's supposed to be blocked, it'll still get blocked because remember, the policies are actually on the server, okay? So there's no, and even if they're using OA, for example, there's no risk of, um, you know, that policy not working because they're on an older client. The policy tip itself, though, will be blocked. It won't work. Sorry? Right, yeah, they'll, they'll probably, they should get a, um, if, if it gets blocked, they should get, um, uh, yeah, they should get a notification by email that says your email didn't go through. Yes? It's Outlook, so it's available in uh, Good question. So are the uh, policy tips available in OA? And uh, the answer is not at RTM, but certainly something we're looking into. Okay. Anything else? Um, the question is, can you configure the 24-hour uh, Outlook policy tip um, sync? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, it's just 24 hours. Yep. No. So the question is, will it affect enforcement? No. The enforcement happens on the server, so it should not affect, affect enforcement. Just the they won't see. Yeah, just the policy tip itself they won't see. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Sorry, could you repeat that, please? Uh, will these features be available in the API? Uh, right, yeah, so, so there will definitely be, the um, question is, uh, you know, will the API, API be available? Yeah, there will definitely be an extensibility story, especially for the templates and the, um, uh, and the reporting, right, and the classification rules. So yeah, um, we haven't uh, exposed that information quite yet, but uh, I'd imagine, I'd imagine, don't, don't hold me to this, because I don't know the exact answer, but I'd imagine it would be available once we uh, go to RTM and GA. Okay. Yep. Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, the question was, if you're able to scan attachments, can you scan with the speech recognition engine? I uh, don't know the answer to that, but... Uh, if you meet me afterwards, I'll, I'll see if I can, I can follow up, okay? All right, should we, uh, all right, so. Uh, Click a number, I think the range goes from zero, well, not zero, one to 3,000. One to 3,000, okay, so give me a number. 180. 180. 192. All right, there you go. All right. <laughs> All right, give me a number. Uh, 2,500. 2,500. 2,457. Is that it? 460. <laughs> All right, it was worth a shot, that's good. Anyone closer? I think that might be the winner. All right, here we go. Thank you everyone, appreciate it.